to Duck Church. I'm Pastor Amy. I'm the youth and young adult pastor here. Um, pastor Chris is on vacation this week after some much needed rest, and he'll be returning next week to join us in worship. So you're stuck with me. <laughs> um, the Holy Clipboard is here. We need some ushers, so sign up to ush. When it gets back to the back, can you like pass it that way? I got it. Okay, thank you. So if you don't mind, as that clipboard's coming around, look in your bulletin. There's this little sheet of paper here that's called the connection card. Pull that out, and if you would, fill out as much information as you feel comfortable sharing with us, uh, particularly if it's your first or second time here, make sure you check the box that says first or second time guest, and then check which service that you have attended also down there for the 930 service. And then flip it over. You'll have time to finish that later, I promise. On the back, there's some next steps that you can take. Our message this morning is going to have some practical application bits that I'll be explaining a little bit in the sermon. So hold on to that, and you'll be able to finish completing the back of it after the message. This morning, our message is going to be based on the gospel lesson from Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38, when Jesus is calling us to pray for the Lord of the harvest to provide workers for the harvest. And so I'm going to be sharing some stories about what God is doing in the younger generations here in our community and around the world and how we can be a part of sowing seeds of faith for this next generation of believers. So I'm excited to share that message with you and have you come alongside of us as we minister to the youth and children in our community. So let's prepare our hearts for worship by standing for the call to worship printed in your bulletin. I exalt you, my God and King, and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. No one can measure his greatness. Our opening hymn this morning is Amazing Grace, number 572.
Confident of God's love for us, let us confess our sins to our gracious and merciful God with the prayer of confession printed in your bulletin. <coughs> Father in heaven, we confess that we have not come to you like little children. We have not turned from our sins. We have failed to be humble, seeking greatness by our own self-righteousness. We have not trusted you. And we, along with the dark world around us, have led astray the young and the families and communities. Forgive us, we pray. Rescue us from self-reliance and guide us by your Holy Spirit as we care for God's kids. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May God Almighty, who caused light to shine out of darkness, shine in our hearts cleansing us from all our sins and restoring us to the light of the knowledge of God's glory and the face of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. So we've come to the time in our service where we bring before the Lord the requests that we have, the petitions that we have for him, um, so that we might be praying for them here in this place and then also throughout the week. Um, I've received a couple of prayer requests already. Lois Green, who typically attends our APOC services in Outer Banks Hospital, and she asked us to be praying for her. Lynn Shields, who no longer lives on the Outer Banks, but she still considers Duck Church to be her church family. She was just recently diagnosed with breast cancer. It was caught really early, so um, she likely will not have to go through chemo treatments or anything like that, but she asked for us, her church family, to be praying for her. And then we also have an unspoken prayer request. Oh, and another one, I'm sorry. This is Tom and Ellen Davidson's last Sunday. Sorry. Yeah, that's <laughs> it. Tom uh, began our Stephen ministry here at Duck Church, I don't know, how many years ago was that, Tom? Like 10, 12? 12 years ago. And Ellen served as our head of trustees for many, many years, and they've been faithful members of our church choir in the past, and faithful members of Duck Church, and they're going to be moving to Virginia Beach this next week, and so... We want to honor them and pray for them as they move on for this place and thank them for the ministry that they've been a part of at Duck Church. Can we give them a hand? <laughs> Their kids have a house here, though, so we'll see them again soon. <laughs> um, are there any other prayer requests for this morning? Yes, John. Daniel Parsons and the loss of his wife, Judy, and their family. Okay. Daniel Parsons and family. Any others? John Barrow. John, I heard. Gwen. Gwen. Watson. Judy. Uh, my granddaughter in law is on her way to Brazil. Her grandfather down there just fell off the roof yesterday and is not expected to live. But travel mercies and for the family. What's his name? Uh, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> God knows. Her name is Jessica's grandfather. Okay. Tom, you had one? Yeah, John and Gloria Summers. Did you say Gloria? Yes. Okay. So Dave. 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 I'm sorry. I can't hear very well. Maybe I'm getting good company. you welcome us with loving arms, our Abba Father. You care for us, you meet our needs, you're patient with us when we're intolerable, and when you, we ask you for things, Lord, you listen, and you answer. And so this morning, Lord, we want to lift up to you our friends, our family members, who are going through some sort of struggle or change in their life. 
and ask that you would intervene, that you would go before them. We know that you're already in their future, and we trust you with them. We pray for those who are sick, that you would bring healing. We pray for Tom and Ellen as they move from this church family, that you would provide for them a family in Virginia Beach, a church family and friends where they can belong and connect with one another and grow closer to you. Lord, we ask for your Holy Spirit to fill us this morning, that we might hear from you, that we might be changed, and that you might call us into bringing your kingdom into this world. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our mission moment this morning is from some of our youth. We went to FCA leadership camp a week ago, and the video is some of the things that we did while we were there, and then also some of them sharing testimonies of what God did. It's a little bit hard to hear in the background when they start to share their testimonies, so... Get your listening ears ready. Let's see it. Hi, my name is Daniel. I go to First Flight, and this week the worship was very moving, and it made me feel very close to God. Hi, my name is Lila. I go to First Flight High School, and I felt a lot close to God after this week of camp, and today I chose to follow God. Hi, my name is Addie, and this week I felt the Holy Spirit moving through me a lot during worship and during chapel. Hi, my name is Rebecca. I'm going into 11th grade, and this week has really like reset my Christian walk with God, and it's just drawn me closer to Him. During that week, four of our youth made a new decision to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Four of them rededicated their life to Christ and were changed. I mean, like, drastically changed in just five days by the Lord's presence there. So thank you for the ways that you support us and allow us to be part of this ministry at FCA Leadership Camp. Our next hymn is The Old Rugged Cross, number 236.
30 seconds to share signs of peace and reconciliation with one another. Go! Guns, one of our college students, to come and read it for us. You can find the scripture and an insert in your bulletin. It's from Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38. into his harvest field. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks. Let's pray together. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts. Be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So today I'm going to be sharing a message called Pray For Me. Uh, by the end of the sermon, you're going to hear an invitation to join in part of the ministry for our children's and our youth ministries, but I wanted to spend some time today sharing some stories of what God's been doing in our younger generations. So my son James, who is an August baby. Uh, his birthday is coming up in a couple of weeks. He, uh, he's about to turn eight. He told me on Mother's Day that he had something special for me, and he and the children in the children's church, back in the children's hallway, had planted some seeds into a little pot. It was super adorable. Can you show that picture for me? Yeah. Yep. And he gave it to me for a Mother's Day present, and I was so excited to have another plant to care for. <laughs> So I said, James, what's planted in this pot? Because I had no idea. By that time, there were just little sprouts that had come out of the soil. And he said, it's new life, of course. <laughs> and I kind of laughed because I knew that in children's church, it was through the whole season preparing for Easter. So the season of Lent, they had been 
talking about the new life that comes to us at Easter because of Jesus' resurrection. And so they had planted these seeds as the symbol of new life, and they had raised caterpillars all the way up to butterflies and released those. And so I had no idea what was planted in the pot that he gave me, but all he knew was that it was new life that was springing up. It's marigolds, if you're curious. Um, and they are springing forth a new life in our window still, and he asked me yesterday if he could water it this time. Because <laughs> I've been watering it for the last two months. Uh, but anyway, I, he didn't know how true that statement was going to be when he said that new life was springing up. About a month after Mother's Day, we were preparing for vacation Bible school. And I had asked James if he wanted to invite any of his friends to come to Bible school. And I suggested that he invite his buddy Pedro from school. Pedro was in his first grade and second grade class. And uh, they seemed to get along pretty well. And I thought maybe he might want to come to Bible school. James said, I'm not sure he really would like to come, Mom. <laughs> I said, well, it never hurts to ask. Um, Adam, can you stick up this picture of, there we go. There's James and Pedro right there with their Nerf guns, because that's what seven-year-old boys like to do. And um, so during vacation Bible school, it just so happened that it was James's new birthday. So a year ago, James accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, which is a whole other story that if I had told that story too, we would be here until 11.15, and the next service just wouldn't get to have a worship service. But James had accepted Christ a year ago, and we had put it on our calendar so that we could remember it the next year, and my husband Jason saw it on our calendar, and he said, what in the world is a new birthday? <laughs> and I said, well, it's the day that James accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, and I put it on the calendar so that we could celebrate it. And then I said, I have no idea how to celebrate it. <laughs> what, what do you do to celebrate a new birthday? And so I did what all parents of my generation do. I, I Googled it. And I, I typed something in the computer and I said, how do you celebrate a new birthday? And it had a couple of suggestions that didn't really seem like it fit our circumstance. And so I decided I would ask James what he wanted to do for his new birthday, now that he's old enough and mature, that he can make these decisions for himself. And he said, I want to have a party, of course, because he says, of course, after everything that he says right now. And I think it's because I say, of course, all the time. <laughs> but he wanted to have a party. So what we did on Tuesday of Vacation Bible School Week, we gathered up his friends from Bible school. We walked down the boardwalk and got some tacos, and we got some ice cream. And then I said, if we're going to do this, James, you have to make me a promise that you're going to share with your friends why this day is so important to you. And so I kind of set him up for it, right? I, got his friends all sitting together on a bench, and I said, James, why is this day so important for you? And he said, just kind of like a natural, regular old day, well, today is the day a year ago that I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, period. Let's talk about ice cream. You know, like that's how quick it was that that conversation had happened. But it was just a joyful time. Kids love ice cream and tacos, and we had so much fun celebrating with him. The next day, Pedro, who had said yes to coming to Vacation Bible School, his mom didn't speak much English. His parents are from Honduras, and I'll tell the story of his parents in a second, but Pedro started sharing with me a little bit about his background and his family's story on the way home on Wednesday. James was in the way back with his nose in his book, like not even paying attention to what's happening and realizing what God's doing in the middle of our minivan. So Pedro tells me that his parents walked for 22 days from Honduras to the Outer Banks. Walked for 22 days. They got here and they had nothing. They didn't have any kids yet, so that was helpful. But they didn't have anything. They didn't have a house. They didn't have a place to stay. They didn't know anyone. And they were trying to make a new start for themselves and live the American dream. And so they would find shelter underneath rental homes because they would be out of the weather. And one day... Pedro's mom, her name is Siapa, she prayed out of desperation that God would help them. And God did. He showed up. God sent a pastor. The pastor found them. And the pastor gave them $2,000 to get a leg up to start their new life on the Outer Banks. After that, Siapa, knowing that God had worked in her life, she accepted Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior and asked Jesus to be in her heart. And as Pedro is telling this story, he said, she did it just like James. I couldn't believe he said that. So I'm just sitting here thinking, okay, Lord, I'm just sort of trying to shepherd this moment here and do whatever you want me to do because I don't want to mess this thing up. 
he's only eight years old. I don't want to manipulate anything for an eight-year-old kid, you know, manipulate some kid into a relationship with Jesus that he's not ready for. But I just asked him, well, Pedro, have you ever accepted Jesus into your heart? It was so kind of natural as the conversation was going along. He said, no, I haven't. I'm not very good at following God. Me too, buddy. <laughs> That's what I said. I'm a professional Christian. It's what I do for my job. And I mess up all the time. But here's the thing. And I just read Romans chapter 10, verse 9 that morning in my devotion time. And I just shared with him what that verse said. I said, in the verse it says, in order to be saved, you profess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And that means that you're saying that you want Jesus to be in charge of your life instead of you being in charge of your life. And you believe in your heart that Jesus was raised from the dead. And so I shared with him really briefly just kind of the story from the beginning of Scripture up into Jesus' life. And <coughs> he said some of those stories were familiar to him. And that was all well and good. And I said, if you want to accept Jesus into your heart, then it's not a matter of trying to be good for God. It's Jesus living in you, following God. You don't have to be worried about how good you are because Christ is good inside of you. He will live through you, and you'll become more and more like him the more that you decrease and he increases. We get to Pedro's house. I drop him off. That was the end of that day. The next morning, I texted his mom, which I was never sure when I texted her if I was texting her or if I was texting Pedro, because Pedro was sort of our go-between translator. She speaks about as much English as I speak Spanish, which is, I can count to ten. And I can say, hola. <laughs> That's about it. Um, so a lot of times when I'm texting her, I'm actually texting Pedro. And that's sort of a dangerous position to be in. <laughs> because if you're trying to communicate with an eight-year-old to his parent, that eight-year-old has complete free will to say whatever he wants his mom to say, right? <laughs> but I texted her. She got the message. She was doing the Google Translate thing on her phone. I invited her to come to our VBS performance where all the kids get up and sing in front you know, of their parents, and she said, you know, waited about 10 minutes, and then she responded, and she said, we will be there, we, I don't know how many Latino families you know, but we is a big thing, like, the whole family shows up, so uh, she and her husband, I don't know what he was doing that day, but he stopped doing it so he could be there, and the younger son, Daniel, was there, <clears throat> Pedro was so excited, you would have thought he was in preschool, because he was waving at his mom like this, and he was shouting, Danny, Danny, get it on video, you know, like, but it was in Spanish, I think, I mean, like, I totally didn't understand what was happening, except for the Danny part, and so Pedro was so proud and excited about this moment, and when the whole performance is done, I go back, and I start talking to Siyapa with Pedro translating, of course, and I just told her, how amazed I was at the ways that God had worked in her life and in her family's life. And then I said, I really feel like Pedro is this close to accepting Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. It just seems like he's ready and he's interested and he's asking all the right questions. It's kind of like he's fruit that's, you know, when fruit is not quite ripe, you have to tug it really hard to get off the tree. But when it's ripe, it just kind of comes off in your hand. I felt like he was just right there, but um, I just wanted her to know that so that they would be aware of what was going on with their son spiritually, and then I just felt the Holy Spirit say, well, just ask the question, won't you? <laughs> so I turned to Pedro, and I said, well, Pedro, do you want to accept Christ as your Savior today? I don't want to force you into anything if you're not ready for this, and he said, yeah, I do, right now, let's go. <laughs> So right, right then, in that moment, sitting in the back pew with his parents laying hands on him and James and myself laying hands on him, we prayed for this eight-year-old boy to receive Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. It was life-changing for me. It's life-changing for Pedro. It's life-changing for Pedro's family. And it's life-changing for James, my son, because a year ago, he had a moment that changed his life forever. And because of his faith... Being contagious and just naturally sharing about his own story, his friend came to faith. And I can tell you my son's never going to be the same again because he's going to have a desire to see all of his friends come to know Jesus like that. God is on the move in our younger generations. It might seem kind of hopeless <laughs> sometimes, but God's on the move. So I want to share with you a little bit about the generations um, that are coming behind us, about Generation Z and 
Generation Alpha a little bit. Um, so you can know sort of the lay of the land of these younger generations of people. Adam, can you put up this graphic here? So just so we kind of are all on the same page of generations. So the silent generation probably is some of your parents um, who were born before the World War. <coughs> Baby boomers, of course, came after World War II. So that's my parents who were born in 1945, 1946. Just don't tell them I told you that. Then I'm, I'm like at the very, I'm in that white space between Gen X and millennials because my parents were baby boomers, so that officially makes me Gen X. Um, but I graduated high school in 1999. Millennials are people who graduated high school in 2000 or later. You'll recognize them by their skinny jeans and their weird hair and their goatees. Um, Gen Z is people who are rising high schoolers, so like 14-year-olds, up through 26 year olds. Uh, we know that this part of our brain right here now through brain studies, uh, this part of our brain, the prefrontal cortex, isn't fully developed until we're 25 years old. So our ability to make decisions well is going all the way up through age 25. So when we think about adolescence, it's not just 12 to 18 anymore, it's 12 to, to 26, it's this Gen Z generation. And then Generation Alpha, is folks who've been born from 2010 to this morning. Uh, that's what Generation Alpha is. So let me tell you a little bit about Gen Z. Remember, these are high schoolers through 26-year-olds. These students have always grown up with digital technology. They don't know a life without the internet. They've never experienced it. They're very globally aware because our world is very connected. You know all this stuff. I'm just reminding you. Our world's very connected, and so because we're connected all over the world, one of our teenagers, um, Abby Wallace, is in Greece this week, and I can see her pictures from Greece like that. I can see where she is hanging out. We're connected for the entire, through the entire world, and so this younger generation really values diversity and diverse experiences. They care about social issues, and they want to be a part of solving those social issues that they see. Uh, this generation is struggling a lot with mental illness, so a lot of them are dealing with anxiety and depression in ways that those of us who are a little bit older have never dealt with before. When I was at FCA leadership camp a week ago, one of the leaders there has worked with FCA for years and years, and he said he'd started going to leadership camp in 1984 up until now in 2023. So one of the other adults who was at camp asked him, how has camp changed from 1984 to 2023. And he said, well, the worship is just as powerful. God is still working in the ways he has. The students are sharing really vulnerably in their huddle groups. But the thing that has changed is in 1984, no one brought medicine to camp. In 2023, more than half of the students who are coming to camp are bringing medication. My mom uh, is a retired pharmacist at the State Psychiatric Hospital in Raleigh. It's no longer there anymore. But I grew up around Prozac and all these sorts of things. So my antenna went up and I said, what medications? <laughs> and she, the guy who I was talking to said, well, it's stuff for anxiety and depression and ADHD. These are the medications that our kids were bringing to camp. More than half of them are dealing with these kinds of issues. Maybe some of us were dealing with that before and we just weren't medicated and we didn't know, but certainly now this generation is dealing with those issues. And then this generation is also called the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, not the nuns in the convent, like the, the nothings, the nuns. So when these students fill out surveys that ask them about their religious affiliation, they're checking the box that says none. I don't believe in anything. I don't follow any creed, any belief system. Uh, a lot of them are spiritually and biblically illiterate. They just don't have the words to understand what's happening in this room in a worship space. Generation Alpha, so these are kids born from 2010 up through current middle schoolers. 2010 was the year that the iPad was invented. These are the iPad kids. I'm glad that you laughed. The first service didn't know what that meant. I was afraid to even use the word meme. So if you don't know what an iPad kid is, an iPad kid is the, the kids that you see when you go out to eat on the Outer Banks and their parents are just done and they just stick the iPad. I'm seeing you guys right there. You're like, that's not me. Um, 
they're like looking at an iPad or looking at their parents' phone while they're waiting for the food to come because the kids don't know how to just be and have a conversation. And they're wanting to play a game or to watch something on YouTube or whatever the case may be. And I get it. I'm a parent of a three-year-old who is, whoo, and a seven-year-old who is very curious. And I love that they have all this information at their fingertips. Um, but it's kind of sad to see that the younger generation sometimes is just completely disconnected from the world right in front of them, and they're having a hard time being present. This generation is used to everything being on demand. So when James wants to look up stuff about tornadoes, which is about every other day, uh, he can just type into YouTube, tornadoes, and he can watch something get destroyed. Or um, if he wants to watch a TV show or something like that, he has no concept of cable TV. So when we go stay in a hotel somewhere, he thinks that every hotel in the whole world has SpongeBob SquarePants on. <laughs> the problem is that every time we go to a hotel, SpongeBob SquarePants is always on. So it's like feeding this, <laughs> this idea that he thinks that he can watch whatever he wants, whenever he wants, because everything is on demand. He can watch whatever show he wants whenever. He doesn't understand why I watch sports on TV, and I tell him it's because I don't know what's going to happen next. It's not predictable. And I have to watch it when it's live. Do you understand this concept, James? Live. Like it's happening right now. If I don't watch it right now, I won't see it again. <laughs> so he doesn't get that I need to turn off the cartoons to be able to watch the game. I'm trying to turn him into a Tar Heel fan. Sorry, Meredith. <laughs> so anyway, this is... Uh, Generation Alpha and Gen Z. Gen Alpha is also the COVID kids. These are the kids who did virtual school during their formative years. So they learned to read and write through virtual school. Um, they learned how to socialize on Google Meets. And we haven't quite seen what the repercussions of all of that's going to be. Thankfully, most of what I see with the kids that I coach for track and, high, track and cross country at the middle and high school here, most of them are doing great. But we don't know yet what the fallout's gonna be from all of this weirdness that we just survived through COVID for a couple of years. In our community, so this is Dare County, right? So Duck, all the way down to Hatteras, over to Mans Harbor. There are 6,800 people under the age of 18. That's a pretty decent size for the size of our community. If you're here on vacation, this is a small town. <laughs> and you have come to join us in our small town. That's why you were stuck in traffic yesterday. Because usually we just need two lanes. But when you come, we need a lot more, right? <laughs> uh, so there's 6,800 people under 18 in Dare County. And then if we just um, track how many students are in the Northern Beach schools, so I'm, we're going to not count Hatteras or Manio. We're talking about Kitty Hawk Elementary, Nags Head Elementary, First Flight Elementary, First Flight Middle, First Flight High School. There's about 3,000 students in these North Beach schools. That doesn't include the ones that are in private school or homeschool, but it kind of gives you an area or an idea of what our scope is for being able to reach in terms of these younger generations who are in elementary, middle school, and high school. There's also kids who are in college who are connected with our church as well. So in January, I was on sabbatical. Thank you. I took a month off to be spiritually renewed and refreshed and to get some rest. If you're here on vacation and you go to another church at home, please have a sabbatical for your pastors. It is so necessary for the health of your pastors and also for the health of your churches, um, for them to be renewed spiritually and to see new vision for what God wants in the future. So part of this time I spent at Asbury Theological Seminary, that's where I went to school to get my master's in youth ministry. So I spent about a week there and then I spent five days at the Abbey of Gethsemane, which is in Trappist, Kentucky. That's where Thomas Merton uh, lived, as one of the brothers there, if you've ever heard of Thomas Merton before. Some of you haven't, and that's okay. Um, and I was on a hiking trail one day by the Abbey, so you weren't allowed to talk at all. Silent retreat. No talking unless in prayer. And most of that was like chanting, because these are Catholics, right? So that was just sort of a whole culture change, but it provided the space for me to get away and just listen to the voice of God. So I was out on a hiking trail one day, not speaking, just listening for God's voice, and then I came across this cornfield. Can you put up that picture for me, Adam? Here it is. So this is January, right? There's not a lot growing in Kentucky in January. 
and it's also the land of bourbon, so there's a lot of empty cornfields there. So I came across this cornfield, completely barren. The only thing you could see were a couple of corn stalks that had been cut down and they were bent over because the harvest had already come the previous summer. And it was completely barren. There was nothing growing there. It was clear that nothing was going to grow there for a long time. But as I was there, it was as if the Lord gave me a vision for what was to come. Uh, just like in Acts 2 where it says the old people will dream dreams and young people will see visions. It's like the Lord kind of gave me the spiritual sight to see what could be in that field. And it, it was like I saw people scattering <coughs> seeds, I guess for corn, <laughs> um, <laughs> throughout that field. And then imagining what it would be like in the middle of July, like we are right now, imagining that me, I'm five foot four, not very tall, but the corn would be higher than my head. People would be sowing the seed, and then there would be a great harvest to be reaped. And the scripture that Sydney read for us is what came to mind. Jesus says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. And so I began praying for these generations who need seeds of faith sown into them. When I spent time at Asbury, I'd also been praying there as well. So some of y'all probably heard about the Asbury revival that happened in February. If you heard about it, can you give me a nod? So I kind of know. So um, I, was in, I was at Asbury Seminary. So there's one road in Wilmore, right? Two stoplights. That's it. There's a water tower with a cross on the top that lights up at night. There's 5,000 people that live there. It's a very, it's smaller than the Outer Banks for sure. Seminaries on this side of the road. Universities on this side of the road. I was doing like a prayer walk, sort of reminiscing about the old days when I was there. And we used to play Ultimate Frisbee a lot. So I had gone all the way over to the college campus to reminisce on those games of Ultimate Frisbee when the seminary whooped up on the university all the time. Oh, yeah. And so I was over there, and I saw all these kids, college students, and somehow I thought I was still their age, but it's like I'm 20 years older than them. <laughs> but I saw myself in them as they were rushing off to class, late for class, and I was just sort of praying for them, you know, completely nonchalantly, just praying that God would move in their lives. Well, three weeks after uh, my sabbatical, after I got back, God did something incredible there. A handful of students stayed after chapel one day and they had been invited if they needed to do some business with God that they could just stay there and pray and ask God for whatever they needed or just praise God or whatever. So that handful of students, Adam, can you put up the picture of the handful of students? So it was just a really small group of kids and because this kid, these kids are so connected digitally, as we talked about, it's not always a bad thing, the word got out really fast. And so people were posting on social media, folks were texting their friends who were in class, and professors were letting kids out of class so that they could go and be a part of what was happening in Hughes Auditorium. And soon it went from this to this next picture here, where the whole place was packed. People were gathering together in prayer. Adults were trying to help shepherd this movement, but it was a move of God in Gen Z. This was something started among college and high school kids, and they wanted to make sure that the college and the high school kids were the ones who were hearing from the Spirit and leading the movement of God. There was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that was almost tangible. They experienced the peace of God in ways they never had before. There was a sense of holy love that you could feel in that space. It got so crowded in Hughes Auditorium because people heard about it throughout the whole world that they wanted to come and visit too. And so soon it started to look like this. There were people out on the lawn. It was about 40 degrees that day. <laughs> and people were waiting in line just to try to get into Hughes Auditorium for about an hour to experience the Lord. And so they had speakers playing outside so that people could be worshiping and praying outdoors. There were other auditoriums and chapels across the street at the seminary that were filled. There were about five other places where people were seeking the Lord and experiencing the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in that place. God was at work in this younger generation, they were hungering and thirsting for righteousness, and God was filling them. God's working in them. You already saw a video of our students who went to FCA leadership camp. I want to give you a little bit of the backstory of the seeds that had been sown and how they became fruit in that week. This week was a year coming. 
Last summer, I was sitting in the church bus. I was going through treatment for breast cancer, um, and so, you know, my hair was really short. <laughs> I wasn't feeling super great, but we were still doing ministry, and these girls were in the back of the van, and they were talking about summer camps and what summer camps they wanted to do next summer. And I said, well, why don't y'all consider going to FCA leadership camp? And one of the girls said, well, why didn't we go this year? <laughs> Just like that. And I said, well, I have cancer. <laughs> I think this, we're going to put this off for a year, but we'll come back to it next year. So one of these girls uh, became a student leader in our youth group. And when she met with our student leaders, we talked about how we wanted to reach out to our friends for Christ. And we wanted to share what we've received from Christ with others, and we want to see them come to the Lord, too. And so we kind of created a plan of who we were going to invite to a fall kickoff event in September. I started to get emails from moms who were signing up their kids to our fall retreat, and I had never met these kids before. So this girl just started texting all of her friends, inviting them to come to youth group, inviting them to come to our fall retreat. And it ended up happening that our fall retreat didn't happen because I got COVID, and so we weren't able to do it. And so these girls had been really, really wanting to have a retreat or a camp experience. And so all their desire was pushed towards this FCA leadership camp. I knew that a lot of them did not have a relationship with the Lord. And I tried to dissuade them from going because leadership camp is intense. It's intense spiritually. It's intense emotionally. The kids get vulnerable very, very quick. And I didn't want kids who were... Uh, very new to the faith or hadn't even come to faith in Christ yet to be overwhelmed by what was happening there. But I could not dissuade them. They wanted to go anyway. <laughs> and so here I am with a bus of 12 kids, some from our youth group, some were kids that were connected with through coaching track at the schools. And we traveled up to leadership camp and you heard the fruit of what happened there. So this girl who was inspired by the Holy Spirit to text her friends, invited her friends. They came to youth group this entire year. They went to leadership camp, and then they had life-changing experiences there. That's the fruit of the harvest. It took a whole year to get there, but that's the fruit that we've seen in our youth ministry. I have a neighbor uh, who has a friend who's friends with these girls. Adam, can you put up a picture of the kids from leadership camp? There we go. She's friends with all those girls up in the left-hand corner, and she's our babysitter. I've known this family maybe for about six years because of track and cross-country. And I had dropped off my kids with Jason's parents in Winchester, Virginia, and so I was home by myself for a whole day. What a luxury. So I went for a run, and then on my way back, I see our neighbor in her driveway, and she was without kids, too. It was like one of those amazing moments. So we got to have an adult conversation for 30 whole minutes. Oh, man, it was great. So she asked me why my kids weren't with me, and I said, well, I'm going to FCA leadership camp next summer. This family has known me for forever. They know I work at a church. They have had zero interest in anything Jesus, spiritual, church, anything like that. They're super nice people. I love them to death. They just haven't shown a lot of interest. And this mom says, well, maybe my daughter can go to leadership camp next year. <laughs> what? And I tried not to, like, say what with my eyes, but I thought, that sounds great. <laughs> and I tried to sort of play it off like, God, what in the world are you doing? And she said, well, and if she's friends with all these girls in your youth group, maybe she should start coming to youth group too. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll make sure you know about youth group stuff, <laughs> I guess. And this girl was babysitting my children on the day that James had his new birthday party. And when she came in to babysit Becca, I guess she was just babysitting Becca. I was taking James <clears throat> to Bible school. James said, you'll never guess what, today is my new birthday, and that means it's the day that I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. <laughs> he said this to our babysitter, who's one of the nuns, and she goes, okay, and I said, well, there you have it, this is us, this is who we are. So she's heard about a little bit from our story, and I just can't wait to see what fruit might come from that harvest of what seeds we've sown over the last six years. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So I want to invite you to be a part of what God is doing among these younger generations. Today we're launching a new ministry within our children's and our youth ministries, and I guess young adults too, because we're including college students, where we're inviting students to invite adults in our congregation to pray for them. 
Adam, can you stick up this next slide here? So it's called Pray For Me. It starts with students or their families. Today it will be checking a box on your connection cards here where you say, yes, I want to be prayed for. Or, yes, I'm a parent and I want my children to be prayed for. We're talking about elementary, well, birth, elementary, middle, and high school kids. Then we're asking you all, if you feel called to be a prayer champion, to answer the call to sow seeds of faith. This is sort of a behind-the-scenes ministry. It's not going to be so much of building a relationship with kid uh, or mentoring them week after week. It's a time for you to pray scripture over that student. And so our goal is to connect, connect each student in our church with two or three prayer champions who will be praying for them. This graphic says one from every generation. I'm not sure we have that kind of generational capacity to have somebody from every generation pray for our students. But when you volunteer to be a prayer champion, you'll receive a prayer guide that looks kind of like this. So this is the one for praying for students, which is code word for middle and high school and college kids. This one is adults who are praying for children. And this guide will guide you through praying scripture for that student. And we'll have a time on August 27th, which is the day before school starts. Usually we do a blessing in the backpacks that day. And we're going to gather all of our students and their families and their prayer champions together. So we'll assign you to pray for a particular student or for a family of children. And we'll get everyone together so that you can meet one another. And then you'll receive one of these prayer guides so that you can pray for that student throughout the entire school year. If you are a grandparent... How many grandparents do I have in here? Yeah. We also have something for you. So when they started this ministry, they realized that there were grandparents who wanted to sow seeds of faith in their grandchildren's lives. The reason that a lot of our kids check the nun box is because your children have checked the nun box. And they're passing on their faith or lack of faith to their grandchildren. But you as a grandparent have an incredible opportunity to sow seeds of faith in your grandkids. And I love that some of you here at Duck Church, you bring your grandchildren to Vacation Bible School and you schedule their vacations around Vacation Bible School. Or you ask me, can my grandchild come to youth group this summer? Or is there a devotion book that I can give my grandkid because I want to pass on my faith to my grandchild? This is an incredible way to do that. So there's a legacy edition of this. If you're a grandparent and you want to be praying for your grandchildren, scripture over your grandchildren, you can check the box to sign up for the legacy edition um, for the Pray For Me campaign. If you're not from here, which I'm seeing several unfamiliar faces and families, we would love to help you take this to your home church. One of the great things about Duck Church is that people come here on vacation, and when you come to worship on vacation, you are sold out for Jesus. <laughs> and I love it. I love it when you come and you bring your families. We would love to help you get this ministry in your home church so that your church can start praying for the children and the teenagers and the young adults in your church and in your community. So if you would like to take this home with you as sort of a spiritual souvenir, I would love to talk with you and work with you to help bring that to your home church. We are uniquely positioned to speak out to the generations below us of the great things that God has done. And the Lord is calling us to be prayer champions, to sow seeds of faith in the life of these kids. Will you answer the call? Let's pray. Lord of the harvest, we pray, as Jesus said, for you to send out workers for the harvest. Some of us don't know how to build relationships with teenagers, but we really care about them. We don't know all the kids in our church, but we want to see them know you. And so I pray this morning, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would prompt some of us to answer the call to be prayer champions. That you would call those of us with kids or those of us who are students ourselves to be vulnerable enough to ask for prayer. Lord, we want to answer your call, so send us, use us. In your name we pray, amen. As we prepare to receive God's tithes and offerings today, if it's your first time being here, I want to share with you that we have a gift for you in return for your connection card here, so if there's any way you want to respond to the message today, you can check those boxes on the back of the connection card and just put in an offering plate. 
But if it's your first time here, there's a table that's in the back filled with books called How Good is Good Enough. Maybe you've heard some of the stories that I've shared today about teenagers and children putting their faith in Christ. This book talks about what it looks like to give your life to Christ and to start a relationship with him. You're welcome to take one of these and for yourself, or if you want to share them, you're welcome to do that too. Now let's receive God's tithes and offerings. faithful to us and provided for us and we return back to you a tenth of what you've given to us so that your kingdom might come in this world praying in the name of your son jesus amen i have lost my bulletin i don't know the number of the next hymn who's got it 457 rescue the perishing thank you
benediction. It's one that I was taught when I was a teenager before I even knew the Lord. If you know it, it's from Numbers. It's Aaron's blessing. You can say it with me. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.